we've learned a new way to find a limit, but remember, it only works if your limit is an indeterminate. That's actually very important. Like I said, don't go to college and say, my teacher showed, showed me that I can do a limit with derivatives. And, you know, the professor hasn't even talked about derivatives. So it only works if it's an indeterminate, zero over zero or infinity over infinity. Um, now, when you get that, then you should be doing derivatives according to L'Hopital's rule. The other thing is that a lot of these limits would not have been solvable back at the beginning of the year. If you're kind of like, yeah, I don't really remember that. Well, it wouldn't take, take too long to go over it. But you would not be able to find this limit using the basic algebra concepts in the beginning of the year. Could you graph it? Yeah, you could graph it. You could graph any limit. Of course, a lot of times we're trying to take away the calculator. This problem is interesting because you do have to understand a little bit about infinity and ln, and sometimes that gets into some sort of foggy territory for people. Um, you know, you can't do the ln of infinity. You really can't do the square root of infinity either. It's not like that's a button on your calculator. You kind of have to think, though, what does that mean? If, and you say, what do you mean? What does that mean? Well, ln is a graph. And even though I just said we're not really going to graph these, you still can envision a graph. Now, again, sometimes the ln graph, kids are like, okay, what's that one look like? This is a log graph. We would have reviewed it in the first couple weeks of school, and maybe it looks familiar from algebra. But where does this graph go? In other words, what height does it go to as I go to infinity? Well, it just keeps climbing and climbing. Now, it climbs slowly, but essentially the ln of a big number is just going to keep getting bigger. And it's kind of the same thing with a square root. A square root, what's, what happens when you do the square root of a big number? It just continues to keep getting bigger. By the way, the square root graph actually kind of looks a little bit like this one. Technically, it starts at, well, sorry, it starts at uh, the origin, but again, basically is the same graph. So bottom line, you get infinity over infinity. That means indeterminate. And I guess right now that's kind of good news because that means we can do L'Hopital's rule. Okay, which brings up a good discussion on how do you do the derivative of ln. Now that's a good one to try to remember, the derivative of ln. It's a rule, like a lot of things are rules this year. Do you remember? It's 1 over x. It's just a rule. It's 1 over x. Um, now, the derivative of the square root is a careful use of exponents. Are we ready to just picture an exponent of 1 half? If you picture an exponent of one half, it comes down and meets this two, kind of cancels, right? If you subtract from that exponent, you get an exponent of negative one half. Okay, now, as I'm sure you can imagine, what's written up here needs to be cleaned up quite a bit, actually. Um, first of all, one over x is going to ultimately end up just down in this denominator. Okay, because that's what 1 over x means. It means a denominator. I don't need two denominators to, to say that. x to negative 1 half, oh my gosh, that's another denominator. Um, if I think about it in square root form, it would be like the square root, well, excuse me, 1 over the square root of x. So here I go again, I kind of have like double denominator. Well, this really should flip back up to the top. In other words, I can flip it and write it as square root of x over 1, but I still have this x down here. Okay, now that, that's, that can also be simplified. Um, you say, well, how? Well, uh, maybe by kind of thinking about exponents again. This is really a 1 half exponent. This is really a 1 exponent. Basically, I'm going to subtract those exponents. I'm going to cancel the x's, but I only cancel like half of them. So I end up with 
end up with a square root in the bottom again. There could have been some other ways to go about this. We could have subtracted the exponents over here. But uh, when it all kind of cancels, I end up with a little more in the denominator. Now, as I sometimes say, we don't want square roots in the denominator, but if you don't tell anybody, I won't either, because all we really need to do is think about the limit as x approaches infinity of this expression. As we sometimes say, you can't really do the square root of infinity, but the concept is that that also equals infinity. In other words, I'm looking at an expression, a recognizable expression. I think we flashed that one up on the screen yesterday, but remember one over infinity is zero. So it's kind of a long story short, we end up with a limit of zero. Remember, even though we're not graphing this, because this might be the first thing you do when you step into college if you retake calculus, remember there's a horizontal asymptote at zero. Of course, the rest of the graph is to be determined, but I know we're going to have a horizontal asymptote. That's what a limit is. It's an intended height. It's an intended height. Uh, I should say, when x goes to infinity, I, I felt like I was missing something. When x goes to infinity, then it represents a horizontal asymptote. Okay. Um, let's do one more that they're supposed to be a little tricky because with L'Hopital's rule, I can make the tricky go away. Basically, when you do derivatives, things are supposed to get simpler. When things get simpler, we have less function, we have less exponent. In other words, the tricky can go away. When I was a student, too, I was, sometimes I was a little unsure about infinity. It seems like I never was like 100% sure, you know, because it's not a number. But if I put infinity in here for x, if I think about having infinity in the numerator and infinity in the denominator, I basically am going to end up with infinity over infinity. Does that always happen? Well, it depends on how the numerator and denominator is created. Okay, but if I have x's in the numerator and denominator, it's going to end up that way. Now, I don't want anybody to miss this, so we'll kind of kill a few seconds here. I don't want to do the derivative of that square root. Um, it was kind of a pain over here. It wasn't wrong, but I, I want to show you another way to approach a square root. You've seen this kind of thing before. We actually did this uh, making a little uh, proof the other day. I guess it wasn't a proof, but we created a formula. But anyway, it's a little trick where you, I guess you could say you change the look of a fraction, but yet you don't change the value. Now, yeah, now I'm doing the square root of the whole thing. If you're like, did you just do the square root of the denominator? Not really. It's not like I did the square root, but I'm going to let the square root, I'm going to let the square root be part of the denominator. But that means I need to take that denominator and adjust it. I need to like balance that. And so it's this kind of this little trick where I change the look of the fraction, but not the value. Now, the reason I did that, or I guess I could say I'm allowed to do that, is because it's true that I can actually do L'Hopital's rule to just the, well, to the heart of the equation. I can actually do the derivative of just the numerator and denominator. It's kind of like that square root. Now, it's not gone, but it's kind of like that square root is temporarily disabled. We're going to do the derivative of the numerator and denominator. It's a heck of a lot easier to do the derivative of just powers. Don't let me have all the fun. You can do the derivative of the numerator. Now, I hope the denominator is feeling like a little inside-outside thing. I hope you're feeling a little bit like the chain rule. 
That's the derivative of the outside, inside left alone, but then derivative of inside. Again, that's that chain rule. Now, as we often say, do algebra before calculus, meaning, you know, simplify. I hope you're looking at uh, the eight and the pair of twos and you're canceling. It looks like the X's will also cancel. Ah, okay. So I'm doing a little algebra before I do the limit. I have to confess I'm being a little sloppy here. We're still doing the limit. I really should not lose that notation. I'm doing the limit of, of my derivative version. Are you guys okay with the cancellation? Because it's it's limit time. Now it's with infinity, but that means you're quote plugging in infinity. It's more like you're thinking about what happens if x gets close to infinity. Maybe you feel like you're seeing one over infinity. That is correct. You should be. I have a mistake up here. I thought something looked. Isn't it two? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I actually get two over infinity. This square root thing, well, it's it's still here. What I'm trying to make sure you guys understand is that what's really going to happen is I'm going to do the square root of, well, of whatever I get. I think we're at the point that we're ready to get something. That is, we're ready to get a number. It just turns out to be zero because two over infinity, two over infinity is zero. Okay, so technically I'll do the square root of zero, but still zero. Somebody says, you never did the derivative of the square root. Well, you're right. I didn't do the derivative of the square root. That's because the heart of the equation was the x's. And so I can do L'Hopital's rule to the x's, and then the square root sort of gets tags along. It's a different, slightly different approach. Okay. It wouldn't really work on this problem because I didn't have uh, like a power function. Um, in other words, uh, to kind of like change the way that this looks would have actually made that one a little harder. There's one problem in the assignment where you'll kind of feel like, ah, oh, it looks like this one, and you can try that little trick. It's supposed to make it easier. Okay, now... Uh, this is what calculus is like next. Sometimes people are like, what's Calc 2? Okay, Calc 2 is taking a lot of the ideas from Calc 1 and applying them uh, in new ways uh, to a new application. Calc 3 is actually uh, mainly what we call three-dimensional calculus, where you're doing things with three variables, x, y, and z. You'll do derivatives with three variables. You'll do antiderivatives.